My name is uh, Ernest Sternglass. I'm professor of radiological physics, emeritus of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And uh, I've been concerned about the effects of radiation on human health for many decades. As a matter of fact, it goes back to uh, the first years uh, when we built a house here in Pittsburgh and we were asked whether or not well, everyone was asked to build fallout shelters, and that's how I began to become concerned, because until then, I was working mainly on x-rays and diagnostic radiology, trying to reduce the dose and get better pictures. But when I heard about fallout back in 19, well, it was about 1960, 61, and I was uh, here, uh, president of the local chapter of the uh, Federation of American Scientists, and so we all became concerned, will fallout shelters protect us from all this bomb fallout or if there were an attack on Pittsburgh? And we looked at the recently declassified data on fallout and we concluded, all of us, that there's no way to survive, even if you survive miraculously in a bomb shelter, the entire environment would be contaminated. And that is how I began, began to realize that our government was not telling us the truth about the seriousness of low-level radiation exposures. Because at the same time, in 1960, 61, I found out about a paper by Dr. Alice Stewart in England that was reported uh, at congressional hearings about the need for bomb shelters. And in that paper, it showed that when a woman receives just a couple of x-rays during pregnancy to find out the position of the baby or the size of the uh, opening, the canal through which the baby has emerged, it turns out that she found that women who had received x-rays during pregnancy had twice the risk of developing cancer in their children, that the children before age 10 developed leukemia and cancer at twice the rate than a control group of women who had the same background, the same history, same age and everything, and so we knew all of a sudden that very much less radiation is needed to damage the infant in utero. Because for many decades, since the beginning of the century, 1895, when x-rays were discovered, uh, we had always taken diagnostic x-rays, chest x-rays, dental x-rays, for granted. In fact, I remember as a young boy walking into shoe stores and watching my toes through the the shoes, wiggling my toes, and so my father was a dermatologist and talked to my mother who was a, uh, a gynecologist and pediatrician about the danger of x-rays, that he had to repair uh, skin cancer that had been produced by other doctors using x-rays to treat acne. And all these mistakes in the early years of medicine led to our beginning of our understanding that radiation is both a benefit and a source of great concern if it's misused. And so I was, in a sense, programmed from early childhood <laughs> to uh, be worried about x-rays, <laughs> having learned about it at the dinner table <laughs> when my mother and father discussed it. So um, that was one thing that made me decide to investigate what happened after bomb fallout came down in the United States. And in fact, um, we didn't have any real data at the time about uh, how many children would die of cancer after the bomb testing, but uh, Dr. E.B. Lewis at Caltech uh, said there would be a significant increase, and so did Linus Pauling warn everyone about the danger of fallout. And so uh, I wrote a paper uh, for science in June of 19, uh, 1963, uh, in which I pointed out that if Dr. Alice Stewart's findings of just a couple of x-rays, uh, which give maybe one or two uh, rads uh, uh, compared to the thousand rads that the government thought we could survive after coming out of a bomb shelter, uh, that one or two rads doubled the risk of cancer and leukemia in children, then the bomb fallout, which was being produced by a gigantic nuclear detonation by Russia in the fall of 1961, and it was enormous. The fallout gave everybody in the northern hemisphere 
the equivalent of an abdominal x-ray the equivalent of two and a half three years of natural background radiation and so I wrote a paper and predicted that there would be an increase in childhood leukemia and cancer all over the world and unfortunately uh, this later on turned out to be true but what I did is because I had a friend who was a friend of a guy who was in the White House as science advisor I consulted with him and showed him the paper his name is Dr. Ralph Lapp and uh, he had written a textbook on radiation and when I showed him Alice Stewart's findings and showed him the huge dose from a bomb test that we really have to end bomb testing and so he helped me to get the paper published and I sent a copy of it to the White House in the spring of 1963 and uh, at that time President Kennedy just after the missile crisis in 1962 wanted to end bomb testing the military wouldn't agree to end all bomb testing in fact even recently our Senate refused to ratify a treaty to end all bomb testing but he at least managed to convince Khrushchev that they should end bomb testing in the atmosphere and underwater and you know in space and uh, fortunately um, uh, he was very involved himself because as a young man he had been misdiagnosed as having leukemia and also his wife was pregnant at the time um, and therefore he was particularly concerned and right after my paper came out he addressed the nation and said we want to end strontium-90 in the bone of our children and leukemia in their blood and therefore I will negotiate a test ban treaty with Khrushchev and he sent the governor of New York to Moscow and it was signed and then he faced the fact that it had to be ratified by the Senate and so he arranged for hearings and the first time and the only time since then in the history of our government that radiation was concerned was was being regarded as of concern to the government and so the hearings by the Joint Committee took place in August of 1963 and a number of scientists from St. Louis, from Harvard and myself were invited to testify about the need to end bomb testing and that fortunately got a lot of women concerned enough to march around the White House with baby carriages and send letters to the senators and demanding that they ratify the treaty and fortunately one of the last things that Kennedy did before he was assassinated was he signed the test ban treaty which was approved and ratified by the Senate and that may have been the biggest legacy that Kennedy left behind because since then we have learned that during the time of bomb testing not only did his own baby die that summer at birth but all across the United States and around the world infant mortality had stopped declining but I didn't find that out until 1968 another five years when I went back to work on my you know concern about reducing diagnostic x-ray dose and so on um, I, I decided that everything I talked about it in public and, and Congress and so I hoped that they would certainly lower the permissible radiation doses and end nuclear bomb testing fortunately they did end testing in the atmosphere but they began a series of underground tests all through the 60s which I only heard a little bit about but not until 1968 did I hear that there was an increase in leukemia in Albany New York which is you know uh, very strange and it turned out it was after a bomb test in Nevada that drifted all across the United States and hit a heavy rainstorm thunderstorm over over Albany and it came down and there was a professor of chemistry radiation chemistry who had a bunch of students in a laboratory in Troy New York right across from Albany and they found all their Geiger counters were going mad 
they had enormous increase in uh, sound and count rate. <coughs> well, they called up the Atomic Energy Commission lab in New York and found out there had been a bomb test in Nevada, 30,000 tons of TNT equivalent that drifted all across you know, Kansas, Missouri, Pennsylvania, New York, and hit a thunderstorm in Albany, New York. And that led to an enormous local increase, just like near the bomb test site in Utah, where many people had for years been getting these bombs. But this had not been recognized, except for Ralph Lapp pointing out that these occurrences did take place, these fallout episodes localized where rain came down, because 90% comes down with rain and snow. And so we encountered the possibility, and he urged, looking for cancer increases in, in, in Albany. And I did indeed find there was a significant increase, almost a doubling in the number of childhood cancer cases four, five, six years later, just as Dr. Stewart had discovered for medical x-rays. And that uh, caused a lot of concern uh, with a lot of upheaval because I gave this talk at a meeting of the Health Physics Society where people were hoping that they could have the benefit of nuclear energy forever, you know, replacing dirty coal as we have here in Pittsburgh and, and have uh, unlimited energy forever, you know, by using breeder reactors and all those things. And then I come up with this finding that tiny amounts of radiation, one one hundredth to one one thousandth of what it took to increase the double the rate of cancer in an adult caused a doubling if it was given to the baby in the first three months of pregnancy in utero in the mother's womb. And that caused a big controversy. John Goffman, who worked at Livermore, the professor of at the University of California, Berkeley, he had accepted a position in uh, Berkeley, uh, I'm in Livermore, to look at the uh, uh, health effects of nuclear bomb for peaceful uses. We were going to build the Panama Canal with detonating a string of 100 megaton bombs. And, and, and so he had the job of seeing whether or not this would produce any effects on human health. Well, of course, he knew it would. But he was shocked to find out how big it was. And then when the Atomic Energy Commission heard about my paper being published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists showing that infant mortality and leukemia rates rose, and not just a little bit, by a huge amount. In fact, I calculated by 1969, 68, some 400,000, 380,000 babies in the United States died in excess of normal expectations because, you know, had been coming down and then suddenly it leveled off and began to rise and then after the bomb test ended it started and resumed its decline. So it was pretty obvious that it was, it was bomb testing and not something else. But of course the Atomic Energy Commission and the people in the nuclear industry just starting to build big reactors all over the nation were very upset by these findings and so this created a huge controversy and and John Goffman was asked to look into it. Well, he did. And when he concluded together with his uh, uh, people, he had about a group of 30, 40 people working for him, that there might be an increase of four or 8,000 additional infant deaths as a result of bomb testing, they wouldn't let him publish it. They said, no, 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 you just write a paper saying stern glass is wrong, but don't mention any of your own data. And so, <laughs> He said, no, I won't do that. And he eventually became a whistleblower. In fact, what happened is they took his money away for his people, one after one. And all of a sudden, after years of working on the effects of low-level radiation for Livermore, he was on his own again. And he went back to Berkeley. The government did not want to know how serious the effects of bomb testing were. And that was the beginning of the story. But John did something else. John Goffman was a very, very consci conscientious person. He was both an MD and a PhD in physics. And he decided to look at what was happening from nuclear reactors that were just being built at the time. 
The first reactor was right built here in Pittsburgh and, and, and got going in about uh, 1958. And uh, he concluded that by 1968-70, from the nuclear reactors that were then operating, about 20 of them or so, he said there would be something like 32,000 extra cancer cases every year.